<laughs> we're exciting. <laughs> All right. Okay. Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad of Damar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechfeli.com. And as you can see here, columnist for the Jewish press. Yeah, I have a column there called Albany Beat, where I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't as the case may be. All right. But speaking of government, yeah, we right. have one of the foremost uh, watchdog, government watchdogs in the uh, capital, uh, Blair Horner. He's the executive director of the New York Public Interest Research Group. So welcome to The Jewish View. Thanks for having me. All right, Blair, it's great for you to be good. here. Now, I always remember when I was in college that NYPIRG, New York Public Interest Research Group, was always uh, a student, uh, always had a, an affinity, a sure. affinity with students. Uh, so want me to describe it? I th go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, NYPIRG is, unusual, is a not-for-profit nonpartisan organization. And what makes us unique is our board of directors are all college and university students elected from the schools that have chosen to have a NYPIRG chapter there. And so I report uh, to a college student board of directors. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the good news in that is that they hold my feet to the fire because they're all very idealistic and not cynical. Uh, the downside is I don't have the normal board of deep-pocketed donors <laughs> that could help make the trains run on time uh, as the executive director. But it's, uh, it's great. And so part of our mission is to give college students an experience in civics uh, that they wouldn't get in a classroom. Sort of a lab, if you look at it that way. And did you start off with NYPIRG while you were in college? Or? Well, sort of. I mean, I, was work I got a job working with NYPIRG in a summer job. It was a seasonal job doing campaign work. And when I was in graduate school uh, at the uh, State University at Stony Brook, I was involved in NYPIRG there. So sort of what I guess. Where'd you go to undergrad? Um, uh, be between Nassau Community College and SUNY Stony Brook. And then I was in a graduate program. You know, there's something I want, interesting, because uh, you say students are involved, and that's nice. But obviously, it's a very small number of students. Just generally, the American people do need a good uh, class in civics. I'm not just a had group sure. of people. They... I, again, probably you know more than I do. I'm sure that is the civics, but half the people don't know who the vice president is, or they, half the people, the American people, don't even vote. 70% really? of New Yorkers didn't vote in the last, last governor's election. I didn't know that. It's like it's ridiculous at a certain level. It's crazy, sort of. But, um, you know, so it's nice that people are involved, but maybe my problem is just how to get more people concerned. Well, that's and, true. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. there's a legitimate angle to it. I mean, we try to do... What I was describing before, when Mark asked me the question about um, uh, NYPIRG's roots, we also have a communi community component where we go talk to people at the doors, uh, and we have probably another 90,000 New Yorkers who are just community members, and we email them information and try to keep them in the loop, but still a drop in the bucket in a state of 20 million. Uh, in terms of getting the, the word out. So but we try to get on shows like this yeah, sure. to get the word out to other well, people. Well, now you have millions of people <laughs> watching <laughs> you over here on the Jewish View. All right. So what, what's your budget at night? At night? Uh, it's, it's roughly $5 million. Roughly. And we have, uh, well, you know, it's a little bit more than that. If it's not for where are you getting the money from? Uh, if you looked at it as a pie chart, um, about half of it comes from small donations from these 90,000 people that I mentioned before. The remaining half is probably split where half of it comes from the colleges and universities to pay to have a uh, NYPIRG staff person on their campus, and we run internship programs and civics projects. So it's like a student activity fee. It's a portion of that, that's right. right. And then the remainder are foundation grants, or uh, we have a, a fuel buying cooperative where people can get a discount on home heating oil if they need it through us if they're a member. So that's pretty much where it is. There's no government money. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, you know, corporate money or, you know, lo lobbying money. Isn't there a spend. controversy on the campus of why should my student activity fee sure. go for NYPIRG when I don't really support NYPIRG or, you I know? mean, the, the, way it sh the way it works in the vast majority of the schools and the way it should work is that those students should be able to get a, um, a refund if they don't want to. We're perfectly fine with that. That to us would make perfect sense. Um, you know, and, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, the students vote for whether or not they want to have NYPIRG on their campus. Uh, and in the same way as you vote for elected officials, you don't necessarily like everything they do. You still have to pay your taxes. That's right. Uh, but in our case, 
the vast majority of the schools you can get a refund, and we think that's appropriate. What would right. be the reason why people wouldn't want NIPERG? Because their ideals are not the ideals right. of what NIPERG is pushing when they lobby at the Capitol. So, for example, I'll give yeah, you an example. Good. So, uh, we worked very hard to, uh, with a coalition of other groups, uh, to ban smoking in public places and workplaces. So, there are people that don't agree with that, right? And the, in the older adult world and in the younger adult world that don't agree with that. So the Mark's point would be then that the smokers on a college campus may object philosophically to the notion of regulating uh, uh, cigarette uh, smoking in public places, and they may uh, uh, not agree with that, and why should they pay for it? Yeah, but uh, so you're a watchdog and you have your own position. Yes. It's not like you're just, That's hey, right. you, you're stealing like uh, Mark always <laughs> tries telling us how many uh, tens, unfortunately, of senators yeah. and assemblymen are felons. That's right. That's right. And, and we have perspectives on what should be done to fix that, uh, that mm -hmm. situation where uh, essentially in Albany, I mean, it's been un it's unbelievable over the last 15 years, there have been uh, 41 elected officials that have gotten into trouble. And here's the list. And uh, <laughs> even a longer list if you go back further in time. Right. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of the political equivalent of a crime wave where you have the leading elected officials, uh, the s former Senate uh, Majority Leader, the former Deputy Senate Majority Leader, the former Speaker, all convicted of crimes in the past Malcolm six, Smith, six months. Malcolm Smith, John Sampson, who were former majority That's leaders right. in the Senate. We've had a comptroller go to prison in the, in the last uh, five Hennessey. years. We've had a governor that had to resign for uh, unethical behavior. We had another former governor who had to pay a penalty for lying under oath. I mean, it really is sort of mind-boggling when you yeah. think about it. And so we, have, so we uh, uh, do what we can to sort of react to that, and we do what we can to uh, advance policy solutions uh, to sort of deal with at least the parts of that you can deal with. I mean, obviously, you're dealing with humans, as you well know. Humans are on a bell curve. There's the angels, the devils, and all the rest of us. And the, what you try to do is pass laws so the people in the rest of us uh, behave, and you catch the bad guys. So let me, so when it comes to uh, the failings of these people, I mean, does it put a stain on the entire uh, legislature, let's say, or in the entire government? Uh, yeah. Because I know that I spoke to one former assemblyman who said he got out because he didn't, he, he felt he was being uh, painted with a broad brush and he didn't want to be in this type of an environment well, or associated with these people. That That's certainly his right not to do that. I mean, yeah. as the rabbi mentioned earlier, large percentages of uh, the country don't vote. This is one of the reasons why. They're just disgusted by what they see. Even the stuff that's legal, sort of the gridlock and toxic partisan environment um, that uh, elected officials you know, sort of behave in is a turnoff to average people who pay taxes. And they're like, we send you to the Capitol to fix problems, not to play games all day. And so it's understandable, and so it is a stain. Um, the, for those legislators, though, and the vast majority of whom are honest, hardworking, want to do the right thing, uh, they get elected to Albany, though, to solve problems. And if they're not solving the problem, they should get out of office, no matter how honest they are. Because they're a part of the problem. Well, if they're not they're fixing not it, they become right. part of the problem. Right. And that's, I think, where the uh, sort of the blame game, I mean, they should feel the moral and ethical and uh, responsibilities and civic responsibilities to fix things if they can. Not all problems can be fixed. Can you by legislate the government. ethics though? You can legislate what's right and wrong and punish wrongdoing. Can you legislate that people behave? Uh, well, you can tell them if they don't, they're going to be punished. And you can have clear rules for what's right and wrong. Uh, and if you don't do that, if you have muddied sort of interpretations and you have ineffective watchdogs, what you're doing is encouraging people to game the system, and we've seen too much of that. But how much, uh, how much minutia do you have to get into to really, uh, you know, really resolve this issue of, of legis I always say legislative ethics is an oxymoron. <laughs> you know. Well, by so, the way, it's not just the legislative no, branch. No, no, no. We executive talked about the executive branch, branch. Judicial yeah. branch has had its problems, right, too. Right, right. So Walker uh, had its problems. I mean, it, what you need is independent enforcement more than anything else. And New, New York has never had that. Uh, and that's why all of these most recent scandals, particularly the big fish, uh, have been uh, the result of federal prosecutors who are independent of the 
so hopefully, of the political pressure. You know, Diff, I wanted to really ask when, you know, because we say we have uh, the Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader, and it's in federal court. And I always, well, it's a New York State issue. Why is it a federal well, court? Well, they, they, these could be federal crimes, and that's what the U.S. Attorney alleged, and that's what they were convicted of, basically theft of honest service, so that you as a public official have a responsibility to give an honest service on behalf of your constituents, and when you're using your public office for private gain, in those two circumstances, uh, then that is illegal, and the jury's convicted both. I mean, it's similar to the Senator Bruno case, who was a local boy, uh, whose case was ultimately overturned on appeal, um, but the same argument was, is that basically you're using your public office for private gain, and that ain't right. Um, and so, in, in these cases, you run afoul of federal laws if you're not careful, but the state laws, and you're right, there are state violations here, but the state watchdogs have been nowhere. And if you believe everything that you came out in the court cases, these issues have been hanging around for decades. So where were the state watchdogs, right? We paid millions of dollars for these guys. Where are they? And so it has to come that one U.S. attorney just happens to make this a crusade. And because he's done that, um, he's Albany's, he's, he's created a political earthquake at the state and capitol. And is Preet Bahara your hero now? <laughs> I don't have heroes. Do you have? Do you have? <laughs> I may have a hero of, after this conversation. Do you have but I don't pictures have one now. of him in your office? No, no, that you, no because look, I mean look. he's doing what you would have hoped the state of yes. watchdogs so would have done. So that would be your job, I mean, because um, Mark introduced you as the watchdog over here, but you wouldn't get involved in those kind of. Well, you we've know. we've done research that have uncovered that have helped uncover things that have been wrong. So. I mentioned before about the uh, smoking in public places. We looked very hard and worked uh, to find uh, evidence of uh, tobacco giant Philip Morris giving uh, on illegal gifts to state lawmakers about 20, 15 years ago now. And uh, that contributed to it. So we try to do research to uncover stuff, but we don't have subpoena power, the mm -hmm. police power. No. We're just a not-for-profit that runs around and tries to do the right thing as best as we see it. So let me ask you, do you there's been talk about uh, the current governor, Andrew Cuomo, having, you know, on the verge or on the cusp of, have, you know, falling into Preet's web of, uh, <laughs> of issues of, of government ir irresponsibility. So do you, do you, I mean, you worked for Andrew Cuomo when he was attorney general right. for a brief period. I mean, is he the type of person that would normally like seek out a way to do something that's not well, I, I'm legal? In cert I'm certainly in no position to sort of comment on what <laughs> someone's motivations or interests or pre uh, predispositions are, right? I, I never saw anything like that, or I would have quit on the spot. But um, uh, I mean, I know that there's been a lot of uh, you know discussion about it, and there's been some media reports about it that the U.S. Attorney is looking into some of the states and um, economic development programs uh, in the way that the governor uh, unceremoniously dumped his independent ethics commission uh, as part of a deal with the legislature and the Buffalo but, Billions issue. Right, well, that's the economic, economic development. development. But, I, right. but you know, whether or not <laughs> any of those rise to the level of a crime, who knows, right? I mean, the problem the governor has is, is you know, this. This, the, this, all of the smoke that's been generated by the um, uh, convictions of some of his colleagues, right, the former Senate Majority Leader and the former Speaker of the Assembly, to some extent taint him by association. But whether or not the U.S. Attorney has anything that was done illegal or not, I have no idea. And I think anyone who speculates on it just feeds the frenzy. Um, okay. uh, you know, you always, the U.S. Attorney knows what he knows. None of us do. Uh, and he would, it would be wrong for him to be telling anyone so, so, before okay. he acted, so, if, he were, if he were to act. Back to the legislature for a minute. If the Assembly, Speaker Silver apparently did what he thought was correct under the Assembly ethics laws, rules, regulations, you know, so he thought he was doing the right thing. Now you come along and you have the federal government saying, oh no, those assembly rules, regulations, they don't meet federal standards, and now I'm, I got gotcha. you, okay? It's sort of what happened with Senator Bruno. Senator Bruno said, oh, I, I asked counsel if this was legal, you know, yeah, buying the, his, a horse or whatever. He asked you know. his employees if what he was doing was all right, right? I mean, the same thing with Silver. The Legislative Ethics Commission, which rules on what's right and wrong and tells, gives guidance to members of the legislative branch, 
they're hired by the legislative leaders, right? So what underling is going to tell their boss that what they're doing is wrong? Because this is it why you helps. Need, because no, this is why you need independent oversight. We don't have the people uh, in. We don't have. You don't. You don't hire the. Pol you don't hire the police force from your own business, right? You. We have an independent police force because they're supposed to enforce the laws. That's what we don't have in New York. And you can't rely on people that you're involved in hiring to give you the opinion that you should hear. They're probably going to give you the opinion they think you want to hear. And that can lead to trouble. But if you're such a good friend of, let's say, the spe a speaker of the assembly, and he appoints you into, this, uh, into the position of chair of the ethics committee, and you're going ahead and, and looking at these policies, I mean, aren't you being a better friend by saying, no, you shouldn't be going down this road, Again, and this is wrong? And I mean, I would think that would be that, What you're saying is reasonable, you know. and that's why maybe you should be the head of the Legislative <laughs> Ethics Commission, right? All we know are the facts. The facts are that the U.S. Attorney brought federal action against the Speaker and the Senate Majority Leader for violating the law. They've been convicted. Right? It's not like we're just guessing. Right. They've both been convicted by a jury of their peers. And so what they did, obviously, is wrong. And I think the message should be to all elected officials that if you're going to engage in outside business activities on your own behalf or on your son's behalf, you should be very, very careful about mixing that up with your role for public office. Because the message is pretty clear. If you're using your public office for private gain, you could, you could be running afoul of the law. Most legislators don't have that problem. Most of them don't have outside jobs. Most of them, if they do have an outside job, have a little one, you know, adjunct at some school, they don't mm -hmm. get a lot of money. There's a very small number that actually have big outside employment. Those are the ones who are going to have to be careful. Those are the ones who are going to get scrutiny, and those are the ones who deserve the scrutiny, frankly, because if you're using your public office for private gain, we think that's a no-no and should be prohibited, and perhaps the U.S. Attorney's actions will make that happen. Well, I. Uh, well, you know, the other yeah, hand, I mean, I just yeah, I would say it's almost impossible now. If let's say, for example, you're a speaker, getting without names, right. you know, they put his name on a law firm. You know, it just, you know, you'd have to just say you can't get any outside income. Right. I don't see how, unless you want to be the a garbage man or something like that right. on your off hours, you well, know, I working mean, at Seven Eleven. What the Congress has is the rule that we think Albany should have. The Congress says. You are allowed to have outside income, but it can't be more than 15% of the highest salary in the congressional branch, around 25000 You can't have more than that. You can't get more than that. And you can't have a job where you have a fiduciary responsibility to your client. In other words, you have to put your client's interests ahead of your own because that's an inherent conflict of interest. Right. How, can you put your fiduci how can you have a fiduciary responsibility to a person as a lawyer, as an accountant, um, while you're an elected official and your fiduciary responsibility is supposed to be to the public. What happens when those are in conflict? Right. So the, the Congress says you can't have those jobs. And if you have other jobs, garbage man, pharmacist, adjunct professor, it can't be more than 25 grand. So that, to, and where did that come from? It came out of Watergate, last major scandal. Makes well, perfect sense well, that that would be the paradigm for New York because you know Watergate how it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. They've had. 35 years experience on um, what the rules are going to look like and so you just adopt that that's what we think should happen in New York and that's this, what we're pushing for and yeah, this ahead. and the Skelos silver uh, convictions were was our Watergate moment here in New York I uh, mean it, well it's it's been one of many Watergate moments I mean the thing that's sort of mind blowing is I don't know where the tipping point is right how many of these scandals have to occur before something happens um, we'll see but so, it's, the, it's the Capitol, though. It's the legislators are going to have to make that kind of law right. like the Capitol. So it's like, again, like you say, you're policing yourself. And right. I mean, what Mark's point was, uh, you know, as well, is that, you know, how can you ask the people who win by the rules of the game to change the rules of the game, right? It is a lot to ask. I'm sympathetic to that. On the other hand, what are you going to do, right? The public is, you know, well, the polls tell you they're outraged by what they see in Albany. They don't, there are some members that have talked to you that say they don't want to do it anymore because it's guilt by association. Well, guess what? Fix it. It's pretty simple. No. Don't start whining and complaining and, oh, I can't do it. So get some bills passed. Let's make this place better. So we'll never make it perfect. As long as there are humans involved, I mean, democracy is a work in progress. 
as long as we have humans involved, there's always going to be something, right? Is that you know this from every aspect of life. There's always going to be something. That doesn't mean you don't do anything about it, though. You try to fix it. So I wanted to say, I sat through four days of the Silver Trial. And the first day of testimony was Amy Paulin, an assemblywoman from Scarsdale, Westchester County. Amy, they asked her about her husband's right. stocks and what, she, uh, what he was invested in. And she was head of the Energy Committee. He had stocks in Con Ed. She had the head of Con Ed testified right. before one of her hearings. You know, she didn't know, but yet she signed the form yeah. that listed this. Yeah. I mean, so... It, so where does it end? Well, you know, how, how do you... Well, when it what, comes to... What, what, what do you take away from that? Because she had two other examples of similar uh, look, issues like that on her financial disclosure form. You so. can deal with employment stuff the way I just described. Now, in Assemblywoman Pawn's case, that's not what happened, right? It's about her investment portfolio. So, you, that's, so what do you do there, right? You can't regulate everything, right? So the deal should be, and the way it's supposed to work, is if you think you have a conflict, you get advice from the Legislative Ethics Commission, and if appropriate, you recuse yourself from certain votes if you have a conflict. Right? They tell you how to do it. It all falls apart because you don't have independent advice. You're asking people that you basically hire to tell you what you want to know. So we need an independent system with clear guidance on what you do about potential conflicts of interest with your investments. You recuse yourself under certain circumstances. If the voters don't like it, they get rid of you. And when it comes to outside jobs, moonlighting, AKA, you can't, you can't do it under certain circumstances. So that we think is an appropriate response, but it does hinge on independent enforcement because at the end of the day, you're gonna have the best laws in the world if they're not enforced, they don't matter. Okay, so I got another takeaway for you on this that you might wanna use for the upcoming session. When, some, when a leader has to appoint someone to a committee, the, the yeah. staff looks at the financial disclosure forms and advises the speaker, no, this person shouldn't be chair of the Energy Committee because of these issues here. So you shouldn't appoint her or him to this committee. So you should appoint this person to this other committee sure. because there's no conflicts there. So it's up to the speaker and his staff who does the appointing that they should be more vigilant. And then it's not coming from the underlings advising it's coming from yeah, you know but <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you but again you're you have the employees asking the boss to change his mind or her mind right so it's always very tricky you need the independent oversight in that particular case though if someone is going to chair the energy committee and they have outside investments or the head of the environmental uh, right. committee in the assembly and they have a, uh, works at a law firm that has practice that spoke, focuses in fracking mm -hmm. right He's, they make him the chair of the energy uh, ENCON committee right there needs to be, they, so what do they do, right? If there's a conflict, someone should say, these are conflicts, and then the legislators should say to themselves, I can't do this committee. There's plenty of committees. There's like 30 committees in each house. That's right. And so, you know, what's the big deal? The problem is everyone, the muscle memory in Albany is all, you know, I can do whatever I want. You know, it's, it's, it's an honor system. I'm an honorable person, therefore I can do whatever I want. And you, when you allow that to happen, people, game the system, and if they get away with it, they continue to game the system, and you end up with Silver, right? Mm -hmm. Where he has a practice, and he figures out a way to make some money on the side and, and drive some um, uh, state funds to somebody who's viewed as a national expert in treating mesothelioma, and then he has this side deal where the clients come back where he can make some money. He's like bringing in, he's like, you know. But he didn't force Dr. Taub, and, and Silver didn't force the Glenwood management to use the other, you know, to send clients to wh whether uh, to Whites, Whites and Luxembourg. Luxembourg. Right. Okay, they, they did that volunteer, and the clients who Dr. Taub sent to Whites and Luxembourg had the ability to say, "No, I don't want to use that law firm. I want to use another law firm." We're not here to relitigate. The I'm case, just letting right? you just... know that, that that's what, where I thought the failing was on the guilty verdict. Well, I, I mean that's legitimate. You I'm know. sure the speak, former speaker probably views it the same way you do. It's not some <laughs> other version, right? But he's convicted. Yeah, he is, and and it I think should only... lay. It should really be pause to anyone who's an elected official in New York State that is making money on the side to think about it. And certainly, if they're using their public office for private gain, they are in trouble. And so they should stop doing that if that's what they're doing. 
And right now, that's what we're left with until the laws change. Okay, I want to just change the subject for sure. a minute because you want, uh, uh, one of the other topics that you deal with uh, is education, as we talked about. And you want to head many hats, Rabbi. Right, and you want to freeze, <laughs> and you want to freeze tuition yes. at the colleges. Yes. Now, uh, when I was in the University at Albany, Nightberg also wanted to freeze yes. tuition. I mean, this is deja vu all over again. Well, when that, do you, I what, mean... What's the point of, uh, in the 21st century, what's the, or in your case, 19th century? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> what is the, I mean, what, what's the whole point of having, you know, public colleges, right? It's a way for, uh, it's a way for basically the mainstream of society to get the education that society thinks is a good thing, right? So it's, it plays out in terms of the economic climate, right? You have well-trained workforce. It, in a, it helps in terms of civic life because if you have a knowledgeable, well-rounded, educated citizen, they're going to make, hopefully, more intelligent decisions on who they vote for. And so it's, society has decided it's a good thing. You drive up the price, you make it harder for people to go. And when you do that, some people don't go. Some people uh, end up with big debts. And so but let me tell over you, the last five years, New York State has raised tuition by 30%. Uh, and there is no other tax that's gone up 30% in New York State. Why should the college students be the only ones who take the hit? But do you know that it's only, fifth, at University of Albany, 15% of their budget is state funds. 15%. 85% get right. uh, uh, from private donations and from endowments. I mean, so that's and why you, that's why you see University of Albany, State University of New York. Very small letters underneath it. And it's okay. going to keep shrinking. State University of New York is going to keep shrinking yeah. as that percentage keeps shrinking well, of there's state a, funds. There's more to the package than, I mean, if you freeze tuition, you're going to force the debate on whether or not the state should be paying more. There was a legislation that passed both houses uh, this session that would have required the state to, uh, part of the deal to raise tuition five years ago was the tuition would go up, the state would maintain its effort, not cut, and then that extra money would be used to enhance the state university system. What happened was, is the details of how they wrote the bill, maintenance of effort was defined as not reducing spending. So as inflation goes along, of course, you're effectively reducing if you don't raise the amount of money. And so what had happened was they were using the tuition to plug the budget hole that was left over. And so that so the legislation passed this year unanimously in the assembly. Uh, one negative vote in the assembly, one negative vote in the senate overwhelming bipartisan majorities that said they're to define what the maintenance of effort would be to adjust for inflation and some other things. The governor vetoed it. Now, that's one way that the state could be spending more to invest in higher education, and we think that's the appropriate way to go, because you're right, the state is spending less and less, and they're just shifting the cost to families that want to go to college. Now, if you're middle, upper middle class or wealthy, it's not that big of a deal, whatever that is, 30% increase. But if you're struggling and you're on the margin, precisely the people that need the help, well, you know, I they take the hit. But when you're right. already at a low level of, of tuition, any increase is seen as a huge percentage. So, for example, if you're at $5 and you want an increase to $7, that's a 40% increase. But you're only getting $2 more. <laughs> Well, okay, but, but people we, say if, if, that it's a 40% increase. If it would debate were over $2, Mark, I'd be with you. You know what? <laughs> but I'm just saying, once you have the lowest, yeah, well, a, low debate, yeah, a low base, well, and you keep increasing, of course you're going to have the argument, well, it's 30%, but it was so low. I mean, look at compared to private colleges and the great deal that they're getting. Sure. You I, know. Mean, I mean, no adjust doubt. for inflation from when you went to SUNY Stony Brook, adjust for inflation to today, and do you see that there's... I, there was a study I saw that looked from the 70s through the late 90s, so it's a little bit dated, which looked at the uh, at tuition in public and private schools, and it basically came down to, if my memory serves me correctly, which as I get into my 60s, it's certainly mm. not always a guaranteed that I remember mm. everything properly, <laughs> but it was essentially the argument was that if you adjusted strictly for inflation, that, the, uh, that you adjusted um, uh, private college tuition in the 70s, and you adjusted it purely for inflation, it ends up where public college is today. Uh huh. And so that's not a, just purely an inflation adjustment, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something else going on out there. The state is spending less money pushing it out to students. You're right, 
that New York's tuition relative to the country is on the lower side. I'm not going to dispute that. Um, but what is happening is people are taking on more and more debt to go to a public college. And I think now if you graduate from, on average, you graduate from one of the four university centers, you're looking at around 25 grand in debts, debt. uh, which, is, which is, eh, for you. Eh, not so much for somebody else, right? What is that per, if you have it, and then you have a 10-year loan that you're paying $25,000 to pay off a 10-year loan, so, well, you know, what is that per month? I mean, it doesn't so, seem like it's that no, onerous when you get a job and but you can pay the, it. The point is, what is the public policy goal of public college? The public policy goal is to let people go, th is to people get that educational experience. Rockefeller so built the SUNY system so it would be free tuition. That was his aim. He wanted free tuition at all the public school, at uh, colleges and universities. That was what Rockefeller had when he built the system. Sounds good to me. Yeah. That's what he wanted. And K-12 once that, is, is free. And once he started, and once they started charging, you know, that was, they no, broke that ceiling. I mean, what we're, what, by the way, for your viewers, this is the debate that would normally be happening at the state capitol. Right. Right. And, uh, and it's civil, right? I mean, right. people have different points of view and they have reasonable differences. This is the way it's supposed to work. Right. Right. And so maybe we can't persuade each other. That's very possible. Um, but I think your viewers would prefer to see this boring conversation <laughs> on C-SPAN as compared to sort of the hysteronics that they're exposed to when they see uh, okay. debates uh, in, New in New York and uh, across the country. And, uh, you know, people have differences. That doesn't mean we have to sort of kill each other. Over okay. Them, sure. So okay. as we're running out of time, yeah, I want you to time. see, I want you to know that uh, the, audi the viewers to know, you deal with ethics issues, in education issues, environment issues, elections issues, all the E's, <laughs> uh, health issues, yeah. like you were saying about, the, and you did work for the Cancer Society for a sure. while. Sure. Uh, you deal, and then, you know, you had, you deal with other uh, issues that Consumer involve issues. government. Sure. Overall, you know, so we we'll have to have Blair back again yeah. over here. That's what it means. I can't wait. Look forward All to right. it. Okay. Listen, as far as I'm concerned, you're an integral part of government. Obviously, you have the three: the executive, judicial, and legislative. But you know, you need a watchdog over all of them. So Woof. you're. <laughs> in any case, you're the man over here, and I think to have a free society and democratic society, you're just important or probably even more important than some of the officials that are elected and have big names. So thank you very much for your Thanks service for to the Much continued to the public. success. Yes. Continue with good health.